Welcome to the First United Methodist Church online worship service. Today's service is performed by Pastor Aaron Ackney. Now here is today's service. our faith, confirm our hope, and perfect us in love. Isn't that good? Uh, announcements this morning. First of all, I want to invite Bob Santos to come up and uh, make an announcement. Good morning, folks. Good morning. Um, Friday and Saturday, Pastor Aaron and I were involved in some activities with Sleep in Heavenly Peace. <clears throat> and on Saturday, I heard him say a bunch of times that today is a great day. Uh, we actually made our first delivery of a bed uh, after a couple months of activity and a lot of work. Uh, but uh, we made a bed, a bed delivery to a little girl. Um, and uh, prior to this, we've received a lot of donations of bed linens, pillows, uh, bed sets, and monetary donations. And uh, we want to thank you all for, for doing that. It's, it's a big help. And uh, it helps towards towards our delivery on Saturday. Um, <clears throat> first, we made the delivery to a little girl named Lacey. She's nine years old. <clears throat> and due to some unfortunate circumstances, <clears throat> she was living with a grandmother. A grandmother had taken her in a couple months ago. Um, and uh, prior to us helping them, uh, the little girl was sleeping in a, a bean bag bed. Okay. So she definitely had the need. Um, both her and her grandmother were super excited. Um, a lot of emotions, even for me. Um, it was uh, it was uh, it was it was really quite an amazing experience. Um, we also brought in a bed that you saw in the narthex. Um, this one doesn't have the sheets and the mattress on it, but normally. We delivered all with that, but we wanted to put that on display for folks to see it. Um, we took some photographs that you can see um, of, the, of the delivery we had yesterday. Um, and uh, I just want to let the people, folks know that too, our delivery, our goal for this year in 2023 um, is to build 100 beds, okay? Um, for a first time chapter, it's a it's a pretty it's a it's a it's a good goal, and uh, the chapter lead that we have down in Or down in Orlando have been helping us a lot with, with with this, and he's willing actually to come up here to help us out when we have our first real build. So uh, we've been working with the community organizations, including Lowe's, uh, the Lake City Reporter, Christian Service Center, the Lake City Chamber of Commerce. And we're trying to get in contact with Walmart and any other organizations that might be able to support either with donations of products or, uh, uh, or even sponsor build. Um, if you're aware of any folks that might be interested in that kind of help, please let me know or Pastor Aaron know. That'll help us a lot. Um, we want to thank the volunteers who helped us yesterday. Uh, Peggy Anthony, uh, Sandra Buckcamp, and Rick and Ann Fortney. Uh, big help in getting the, getting the best together. Um, if you want to help with Sleep in Heavenly Peace, uh, we need a lot of help. And uh, right now, um, we need some help with donor tracking and administrative support, along with volunteer support, build manager, 
delivery manager, community liaison, uh, social, media, social media, as well as build volunteers. Um, our first build, we're hoping to do at least 10 beds, uh, so we're going to have to plan for that activity. But if you have any questions or uh, suggestions, anything like that, please uh, let me know or talk to Pastor Aaron. Thank you very much. stand if you're able for the call to worship it's in the world it's from Isaiah 11 1 through 4 and 9 2 through 6 if you'll follow in the boat a new branch will grow from a stump of a tree the spirit of the Lord will rest upon that king Before those people lived in darkness. God, you have caused the nation to grow and made the peoples happy.
song uh, in the bowl. A child has been born to us. God has given a son to us. He will be responsible for leading the people. His name will be
giving this morning in your bulletin. Good King Wenceslas is a Christmas carol that tells a story of a bohemian king who's cut, who goes on a journey, braving harsh winter weather, to give alms to poor peasants on the Feast of Stephen, December 26th, the second day of Christmas. In this season of charity and goodwill, may we generously share our blessings. Father, we begin by thanking you for all of the blessings and the things that you have brought into our lives, all the resources, all of the help, all the goodness. And Lord, we just would ask that as we have returned a portion of these, that you would bless those and multiply them and put them to use for your kingdom. And you would bless each person that has brought a gift or an offering today. Lord, we recognize you as the one sovereign creator, God, and Father of all people. 
And we turn to you as the only place where we know where we can find truth and love and hope and help. And Father, we're in a place where we, we need your help in this nation. Lord, we would pray for the leaders, all the leaders in the nation and in our states and in our towns. Father, we would ask for your guidance and help as we're dealing with the border crisis and with the economy crisis and how those two things are really linked together. Lord, we pray for the acts of violence that are increasing and the tension and the stress on the part of many, many people. God, we pray for your Holy Spirit to help us be a witness to your will and word and way. Father, there are many people that we know and love who we would lift to your throne of grace right now. As the sound of these names rise to you, Father, we thank you for your response in each of their lives. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit while we are here in this attitude of prayer. And maybe we don't know how to pray as we ought. We ask for your spirit to intercede for us, making prayers that you know and understand that maybe even go beyond our comprehension, but because of the love that's in our hearts, the spirit can use that love 
in needed prayers. And we trust, Lord, that that would happen even today. And now, Father, we, we've been praying with united hearts. Now we would unite our voices to use the prayer that you brought to us through your Son. When he said, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As always, I pray this traditional prayer. Lord, as we come to this moment now in our worship today, I ask that either through me or in spite of me, May you speak to us, and may our lives be changed. In Christ's name, amen. So we're in the third week of Advent. Our theme is God's yes. For in him, in Christ, every one of God's promises is a yes. And for this reason, it is through him that we say, Amen to the glory of God. So yes, there is a creator. Yes, we can depend on God. Yes, God is with us. Emmanuel. Some of you already got that message this morning. Yes, there is certain truth. Yes, there is a right way to live. Yes, we can have a new life. Yes, your life can be changed. Yes, you can be redeemed. Yes, you can be born again. Yes, Christ has overcome the world. Yes, Christ and grace is greater than sin and death. And yes, we are heirs of God. Joy is probably the most significant Christian marker in our lives. What identifies us the most as Christians is joy. And joy is more than happiness, just as happiness is more than pleasure. Pleasure is in the body. Happiness is in our mind and feelings, but joy is deep in our heart and spirit. It's at the center of ourselves. Now the way to pleasure is power and prudence. The way to happiness is moral goodness. The way to joy is sanctity, holiness, in loving God with our whole heart and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Now, of course, everyone wants pleasure, but more deeply, everyone wants happiness. And most deeply, everyone wants to live in joy. The former guru of psychology, Freud, who, by the way, has pretty much been discredited at this point, said that spiritual joy is a substitute for physical pleasure. He thought that people became saints out of sexual frustrations. And as many other things he said, that's just about the opposite of the truth. 
On the other side, St. Thomas Aquinas says that no one can live without joy. That is why one deprived of spiritual joy gives over to carnal pleasures. In other words, sanctity is never a substitute for sex. But sex can often be a substitute for sanctity. And that helps show why and how joy is a marker in our Christian lives. Far too many people do not experience joy deep in their hearts and souls. And that's because they have not or do not embrace the sanctity and love of God in their hearts. Such people are reduced to struggling for some level of satisfaction on their own efforts, wallowing in the lesser realm of happiness and pleasure, never reaching the goal of joy. We see this wide scale in our culture right now today, don't we? As people reject and rebel against God, they are left trying to cope with life on their own human resources. Such resources, quite frankly, are insufficient for fullness of life and true joy. You can find pleasure and happiness, but not joy. People are left dissatisfied and desperate. Now the Bible is not some mythical storybook, friends, in spite of what many would want us to believe. It is God's truth, the Creator God's truth about how life works. Look at the decay and the misery that we are experiencing all around us. Some people would want to argue that what we see are, and are experiencing is not really decay, but it's some form of progress and change. And that only people who are resisting that change are the ones who are out of sorts. But that's not what God tells us in his word. Joy is the marker for people who belong to God. So how much joy do we see around us? Isn't that one of the things really that should make this gathering right now, when we come together so special? I mean, we should be the most joyful people in the world. So when we go to our little spots in the world, we present a little, a little touch of joy. But when we all come together, joy should just be busting out of these windows. Remember, there is a right way to live. And that brings us joy. Solomon, with all of his wisdom, recorded this truth in his writing. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them. The absence of joy is an example of that. We're reminded that fearing God is not about being afraid of God of being, it is about being in a right relationship with God. It's about worshiping God. Being out of a right relationship is the single greatest culprit stealing people's joy today. When our boys were young and living at home, they knew 
about our love for them was one of our goals as a parent, that they would never question our love for them. And we knew about their love for us. And because of that, we could instantly tell when they were, I'm going to use the word nervous around us. And we could identify that they had done something that we would not approve of. And so they were antsy around us. They felt convicted around us. They had that knowledge in their hearts, even though we had not confronted them, of not being in a right relationship with us. That's exactly what happens with God and ourselves, church. And it's the explanation for life's stress and distress rather than joy. We cannot be in harmony with life if we are out of tune with the creator of life. Doesn't that make sense? I mean, when we are out of tune with the creator and not in harmony with life, things do not go well. They go poorly. It can be nasty. And life can become even more than miserable. It can turn harmful. It can turn hurtful. And every day, we hear and see new evidence for that in our nation. Yes, we can be in tune with the creator of life. And we can be in harmony with life through Jesus Christ, the babe born at Bethlehem for that very purpose. The simplest, most undeniable proof that Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, is right and Freud is wrong is by our experience. It's not a matter of just faith alone. It can be proved by experience, by many, many people, many, many times. You can repeat it and prove it to yourself. You can be absolutely certain that it is true. Same way you can be certain that a fire is hot and an ice is cold by experience. Millions of people for thousands of years have participated in this experiment. And not one of them has ever gotten the wrong result. All who seek, find. This is not just a promise about the next life or the heavenly realm. This is a promise about right here, right now, proven by experience, tested by experiment, experimenting in our lives. Here's the deal. No one who ever says to God, Thy will be done, and mean it in their hearts, has ever failed to find joy in their lives. Not just a future joy in heaven, but joy right here, right now, in this world. Christ fleshed that out for us when he came to be among us. He showed us. He lived that. For example, the joy that comes from the Garden of Gethsemane. We don't often think that way. Joy in the Garden of Gethsemane. 
were under the pressure of his personal human desire to avoid suffering, he was still able to maintain a right relationship with God and say, yes, not my will, but your will be done. In the very act of that self-surrender to God, there was joy deep in his heart. Not later, not when he rose to sit at the right hand of God again. No, right then in the garden, he had that deep joy. And I'm going to point that out to you because there's a little passage that we often read that we often don't know how to understand and interpret. It's from Hebrews chapter 2, or chapter 12, verse 2. And it says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross scorning its shame, and then sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. How else can we explain that? Unless we understand it's the surrender of being in right relationship. Now oftentimes no is an easy way out in our lives, isn't it? It would have been a lot easier for Christ to have said no in the garden. And conversely, yes is costly. Yes sent Jesus Christ to the cross. So what was the joy that was set before Christ that he would endure the cross? Well, it was the joy, first of all, of maintaining his right relationship with the Father, thy will be done. And it was the joy of knowing that he was ushering in salvation for all of us who would accept his sacrifice by faith. That our joy could be like his joy. That's the only way we could attain joy. And it was his joy to bring that to us. And with that yes from Christ, God was then pleased to maintain the right relationship of the divine yes. And he rose sinless Christ from the tomb with an everlasting resurrection life. Over riding death and sin. So here's a fabulous truth to live by. This is an interesting statement when I came across it. It fascinated me. No can only prevail for two days. Isn't that fascinating? I mean, think about that for a second. No can only prevail for two days. Why? Because on the third day, God said yes. Fascinating. Christ's empty tomb is what takes away our gloom. Death cannot hold a righteous life. Our joy became complete in Christ. And so, when we can sing for joy in the face of death, we can sing for joy in the face of anything. Right? Fearing God is in our best interest. Anyone who has not accepted Christ's gift of salvation is still at odds with God, still separated from God, maybe even an enemy of God. 
And that person has every reason to be afraid. Anyone who dies in that state stays in that condition of separation eternally. The Bible calls that hell. That's because fear and joy do not coexist. We talked about that a week, two weeks ago. But once our sins are confessed to God and we accept the forgiveness of Christ, then we're told that we can come boldly before his throne with access as his children to his grace. Yes, we are heirs of God. We are his children. We have that privilege. It brings us deep joy to know that. Now, we still fear him, but that fear in no way diminishes our love for him or his love for us. Every time I have ever said yes to God, with something even slightly approaching my whole being, what I truly feel, every time I have said Thy will be done in my life, surrendering. I have never failed to experience the joy of God and peace and strength and assurance that I can move forward at that very moment. That's the joy that sustains our daily living. But it has to be real in our hearts. Because that joy will only rise to the level in which our honest surrender has been made. And it's not just me. Every other Christian who has done the same thing has experienced the same thing. They've gotten the exact same result. That's what I was talking about. It's provable. I, I know there's a bunch of people in here who have proven it in your life. Amen? Raise your hand. Yeah, that works. It's as certain as gravity. It's a promise. From God. That's the way God has designed it. It sounds too good to be true. It sounds like it's some kind of a pious exaggeration, like some kind of a used car lot salesman's pitch. Instant joy? All you have to do is surrender to God's will? What's the catch? Well, it's not really a catch, but it's reality. Did you really surrender? Did you mean it in your heart? Because the depth with which you meant it is the joy with which you will receive. And what does that mean ultimately for us? It means we have to be willing and ready to die to self, not physically die in our physical bodies, but die to myself, to die to my pride, to die to my self-desires. I need to let go and let God. I need to surrender my ego So that myself will not stand in the way between God and me. It's our human nature 
to resist giving ourselves up. Some people even fear that. Even more than we would fear facing some sort of physical death. Surrendering myself? My ego doesn't want to do that. And yet it's my ego that is causing me all of my misery in life. Paul says our ego is the flesh, the old man, the old self in us. From the law of Abraham, it's the old nature. Surrendering myself, my will to God, is a type of death. I'm willing to give myself up. But what does Jesus say? Those who lose their life will gain their life. That's why he says, take up your cross and follow me. It's a scary thing to do. It's hard to do. Because we love ourselves. And our, we want what we want. That's the whole point of surrender. And the question is, who will we worship? Because what we surrender to is what we worship. Now this might be a shock, but not all of our thoughts are our own. We've said that before. And the evil one is going to put a voice in us telling us, you don't want to do that. Don't go there. Don't allow God to take over your life. You need to be in control of your life. God's really not safe. God might even kill you. And you know what? There is some truth in that, which is always what we have to be aware of, right? The evil one always says something that's partially true in order to twist it so that we believe something that's not true. It is true. God is not safe. We can be killed in God's word. It tells us. God has made it possible for us to go to hell. Just like he's made it possible for us to avoid hell. The Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe, Volume 1, the Chronicles of Narnia, made it very interesting, made that point very in a very interesting way. You might remember the scene. It was unfortunately altered in the actual movie as opposed to the book. Where the children were being introduced to Aslan by Mr. and Mrs. Beaver. Aslan, of course, is the lion who is the ruler of Narnia. And in the book, of course, that's C.S. Lewis's figure for Christ. Lucy asks Mr. and Mrs. Beaver, is Aslan quite safe? I feel rather nervous about meeting a lion, she said. That you will, dearie, and make no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either braver than most or just plain silly. Then he is not safe, said Lucy. Safe? said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he's not safe. But he is good. He's the king, I tell you. Yeah, God is good. But until we understand the truth that he is not safe, that he is not under our control, until we come to grips with the truth of his uncompromising holiness in the world, we will never be able to grasp his amazing grace that allows us to escape sin and death. If we allow, God will take away our heart of stone and set us free from being selfish and unhappy and bored and wretched. He will touch us with his goodness 
and we will be born into a new and eternal life. So here's the reality. Here's why our mission is evangelism. Inside everyone is a great shout of joy waiting to be born. There are a lot of miserable people around us. How do we see them? Do we see them as people who have a great shout of joy waiting to be born in them? Yes, you can have a new life. Yes, your life can be changed. Yes, human nature can be changed. Yes, you can be born again. Yes, you can be the heir of God. Yes, Christ overcame the world. Yes, Christ is greater than sin and death. Yes, you can live in joy. And the reward for our surrender is beyond description. And the joy is unspeakable. Isaiah said, with joy, you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. So, to close this up, yes, joy. Joy is the marker for truly being Christian. Because that joy is based on our salvation of being in a right relationship with God right now and forevermore. And it only comes through the babe born in Bethlehem who took our sins to the cross. Church, what the world has to offer is incomplete and transient. It's here today, it's gone tomorrow. It's shallow and it's slippery. There's no consistency to it. And there can't be because the world is always shifting according to how evil is manipulated it. It's only faith and love and joy, which are a package deal in our lives, that allow us to overcome the world. The joy of the Lord is an invulnerable joy. Nothing can prevail against it. Nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ. That's the joy of the Lord. It's our strength. The world cannot give us that kind of joy, and the world cannot take that kind of joy away from us. So the power and the influence of our Christian witness in the world depends upon our joy. Christmas calls us to share the joy of the gospel of good news. A Savior has been born, and I know him. It's a joy that we can experience and participate in to a meaningful degree here, but it's a joy that's absolutely indescribable when we all get there. Now some people might be skeptical about this today. That's okay. I never have a problem with people being skeptical about this. You know why? Because you can test it and prove it for yourself. You don't have to depend on me or my words. God invites everyone to try it and see. But be warned. When God's joy fills you, it will spill out everywhere. Heavenly Father, indeed, may we have that joy today. Amen.
May our hearts be drawn closer to God this Advent season. God is offering the divine yes to all of us. We need the power of God's yes to each of our lives. So go forth with renewed vigor through the awareness of God's yes. Thank you for joining us. God bless you until we meet again.